If you're here for public comment, please step forward if you have three minutes. Uh, please spell your last name for the record and state your address or your city. We're on public comment now on any item that's on the agenda. Thomas Slattery, 6869 West 32nd Avenue. I want to comment on item three, height and density. I hope the council will stand by its earlier decision not to put this on the ballot. I'm not going to go into my views on it because you know them very well already. But I think there are some real serious problems here. Wheat Ridge 2020 is sponsoring the issue. They're a city funded agency. I see a potential for city funds at least indirectly ending up promoting this issue. Is this legal? I don't know, but if it is legal, is it ethical? I sure don't think so. And let's go on to the issue of equity. This council is responsible to equitably treat all persons and agencies who have an, a, an interest in this issue. And if city funding is somehow going to end up in this issue, I don't see how any opposing agency can match it. So I really urge you to stick by your decision not to put this on the ballot. I think the only proper way to do it is for an agency that has no connection with the city to circulate petitions and collect monies independently to promote this issue. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have anybody else here for public comment? Please step forward. Uh, please spell your last name for the record and state your city or your address. Nancy Snow, SNOW. I was horrified to see the height and density on the agenda tonight because I had heard wrongly, apparently, or maybe not, that you had decided not to go to the ballot this year. Is this not working? Is it working? I really genuinely feel that getting more density in this city and higher buildings is going to ruin the city. And I have heard all the arguments for None of them, I think, make any sense. Supposedly, we have an incredible number of businesses that won't come to the city because of our heightened density limits. And that makes no sense. Commercial is always on the first floor. They don't need a tall building. And the developers, I guess, like more density. I promise you, more apartments is going to make money for the developer. It's not going to make any for the city. Anyway, I didn't have enough of a breath except to tell you I hope that I don't see it on the ballot this year. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have anybody else here to speak on our public comment? Uh, seeing none, we'll move on to uh, uh, the agenda. Any changes to the agenda tonight? Seeing none, we had um, item one with staff reports. No staff report. No staff reports. Oh, that's right. You're our city acting city manager tonight, right? Uh, item two is I-70 and Kipling Street. Uh, Mr. Pronto. Yes. Um, CDOT is, is here this evening. Danny Herman is wants to uh, give you an update concerning the Kipling PEL and the uh, the outcome of that. And uh, so he has a short slide presentation for you. Thank you. Please step forward and to the podium and. Uh, Welcome. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for having me here. My name again is Danny Herman. I'm the planning program manager for CDOT, formerly of CDOT Region 6, now CDOT Region 1, the new major mega region in the metro area. Uh, we spoke a little while back to you guys on the I-70 Kipling PEL study when it was underway. That study is just about to wrap up, so we wanted to come back and give you guys an update on it. So we'll walk you through. A little brief overview again on the purpose of the project, um, just to address the issues that are at the I-70 Kipling interchange reduce congestion, improve operations and safety, uh, improve access to all modes. So we identified some of the current problems, operational efficiency, traveler safety. 
The key elements of the study, we wanted to identify the long-term vision, uh, narrow the range of alternatives to give us something to move forward more quickly into the environmental stage, uh, complete community and resource agency involvement in public outreach. And uh, we'll get into this. One of the first things we did through agency coordination, we started out, we gathered comprehensive plans from Jefferson County, Wheat Ridge, Arvada, looked to see what was on the plans to make sure this met. We started out with technical team meetings, which included staff, uh, as you can see, from Wheat Ridge, Jefferson County, Arvada, Dr. Cog, CDOT, RTD, and FHWA. Uh, we had a couple of resource agency coordination points. Um, these are EPA, the core, anybody who might have uh, thoughts like that, we coordinate with them early on. We have our elected official briefing presentations, one of which we're doing now, and then small group meetings with stakeholders. Uh, we Early on, we identified three groups of stakeholders, uh, business interests, citizens or residents, and uh, multimodal partners. We also, through our public meetings, heard that emergency service providers would be a good group, so we met with them as well. So we've held two public house meetings. Meeting one in April, we had over 50 attendees. Meeting two, uh, just last December, over 75 people attended. And then the number of focus groups like we talked about. So the study recommendations, uh, I'll just breeze through this. This is a lot of what we talked about last time. Uh, we eliminated, or we evaluated 33 alternatives in level one, just simply a thumbs up, thumbs down, do they meet the purpose and need of the project? So we went on to level two screening and we had 16 alternatives at that point that we carried forward. In level three screening, we've evaluated four alternatives. We've narrowed it to two. All four of those will carry forward into NEPA, which is the environmental decision-making process but two of those are our recommended projects. So the other two should be fairly quickly dismissed. So the four alternatives that we will carry forward into NEPA are the single point urban interchange, the partial cloverleaf, traditional diamond interchange, and the button hook ramps. And the two recommended will be the single point urban interchange and the traditional diamond interchange. So the single point urban interchange, this is a fairly typical urban layout. Um, it won't have any change to the frontage road access or won't require any change to the frontage road access. It improves the ve vehicular operations. Um, there's only one full right-of-way acquisition. Really, the two alternatives we're moving forward are the single point and the traditional diamond. The biggest difference in cost and implementation, the single point has to basically be built all at once. The construction costs are higher, the right-of-way costs are lower. Uh, operationally, you'll see some differences as well. The total cost for the two is roughly the same. Um, so we'll move into, well, here's a, a picture of the single point urban interchange, or SPUI as we call it. Um, give you guys a chance to take a look at that. You'll see the partial acquisitions. The only full acquisition we have planned is uh, of the Conoco property here. And that's because we're gonna be limiting the access so much with our ramps that we anticipate uh, needing to take a full take of that property. And so we identified, since we will likely have to do a full take, that that would be a, a strong candidate for a water quality pond. As we move forward into the NEPA and further design, we'll narrow a lot of this down. So this is very preliminary, but trying to take a look at which accesses we think we can maintain. You'll notice on this one that we do maintain full access, uh, full movements at the 49th Avenue interchange. With the next alternative, you'll see that uh, we don't, we aren't able to do that. And with this alternative, it can go either way, but we felt like it could be maintained, so we're showing it that way. You actually get more operational benefit if you adjust the interchange to be a right in, right out, which you'll see on the next one coming up. The second one that we're recommending is the traditional diamond alternative. This is probably your most common um, interchange layout. It's gonna have a few more full right-of-way acquisitions. As I said, the right-of-way costs are higher. This one, the construction costs are a little lower and it provides more opportunity to be constructed in phases. Um, again, you see the total conceptual cost for both of these, they assure us, um, unintentionally came out to be roughly the same when we added in the right-of-way and the construction costs. So you'll notice here that there's an, quite a few more full acquisitions, particularly on the south where we have the realigned frontage road. Uh, we are showing full take of the Ramada and we've identified those as two probable locations for a water quality pond as well. Again, those decisions aren't made. We'll carry them forward into NEPA. And then you can see here on the 49th Avenue, it's converted to a right in, right out. And so it'll limit access. Primarily those coming westbound will not be able to turn left directly onto 49th Avenue. They'll have to come up to 50th. Uh, 
And then it does also, because of that, limit pedestrian mobility, since they can't cross uh, east-west across uh, Kipling at 49th, so they'll have to either come down to the interchange or up to 50th. We have met with RTD and the bike ped groups, and both of them are in favor of these two alternatives and feel like they don't have a significant negative impact to any of the traveling public up there. So early action and ramp improvements. Uh, one of the things we asked our consultants, David Evans, to do is look and see what things might fit with any of our recommended alternatives. They're first that we have, uh, if you're familiar with CDOT's ramp program, we applied for a ramp application for this. And it would be eastbound on-ramp, making that more of a continuous lane as opposed to uh, dropping before Wadsworth. It'll shift the I-70 median, provides room for additional traffic. It does narrow that shoulder lane. This isn't an interim improvement. This would remain until I-70 is fully reconstructed, which we don't have a plan for. We would have to get FHWA approval to have the narrower than standard shoulder. Um, but this is compatible with both alternatives. Uh, it's been reviewed by our traffic group. It provides immediate operational and safety benefit at a fairly low cost. This is a, a picture of that. And you can see here that this on-ramp essentially just becomes a fluid lane. So it you don't then have to merge into traffic. The biggest concern we uh, addressed when we looked at this was traffic merging over for the left exit at 76, and there's no real concerns. We ran it through all the models, and it's been reviewed by both David Evans and CDOT, and operationally, there's no concerns there. On the westbound, we have a couple of potential alternatives. Uh, these, the largest public safety concerns and the largest concerns in general we got from the public involve the westbound off-ramp the backups, the traffic moving onto westbound 49th. So there's two options Consider We'd only implement one of these two alternatives. One of the interesting things is both of these alternatives are throwaway in the long term, meaning they don't work with either of our long term alternatives. But given the relatively low cost, we think that either of them, depending on how long it's going to be before we build the interchange, will probably provide enough benefit to justify us building it even with the throwaway. So the two alternatives here, the first is the double right with one free flow lane. So this lane here will free flow unsignalized, westbound traffic can move directly on. There's also another lane here for folks that would stop at the signal and turn right. In modeling, this one tends to work best because people who want to go left at 49th or anything can get into this lane here. Behavior-wise, we've seen a lot of times that people don't necessarily drive that way, and if there's a free lane, sometimes they still take it. So we will do further modeling to see which of these. The second alternative is slightly more expensive. Both of these under a half million dollars, which at CDOT terms is pretty inexpensive. Uh, this one down here has a signalized double right. As you can see, if I can get the mouse to work, uh, the two lanes, there would be a stop here, um, a signal, and pedestrians can cross there at a signalized crossing as well. So, like I said, different costs for these alternatives. Neither of these is currently being funded, but both are being moved forward. The biggest consideration there is when do we think we will be able to fund the interchange? We don't want to build the throwaway and then right on top of it build the interchange, but if it's going to be there a few years, there's enough, when we run a benefit cost analysis, enough benefit to justify doing either of these improvements. So our next steps, we're at our final s stakeholder coordination. Uh, agency support documentation, you will probably, in the near future, be getting a request for a letter of support uh, from your jurisdiction that we can put into the report that says that Wheat Ridge was on board and supports the recommendations that we've put through. We're finalizing the PEL report and the study recommendations. We were hoping end of May, and our federal partners have um, struggled to get us all of their comments on time with some of the reorganization going on, but in the near future, we hope to have the PEL report finalized, the final study updated and distributed to the public, hopefully by the end of the state fiscal year or this month. Um, the website has all the documents and we will send notification out to all of the people who have previously given us their contact information to let them know the final report's available. So this again is a document we've had at the public meetings out before, shows that we're still just up here at the very beginning. The next step out of this would be identifying individual construction elements, going through the environmental process for those then design and construction. Biggest key to these is cost. So the first project we will likely pull out is going to be that eastbound continuous on-ramp. And that's, I think, roughly in the $700,000 range is our early estimates. 
We will also at the same time be moving into NEPA to narrow down those two alternatives into one final alternative for the interchange. Um, and then depending on which alternative is selected, we can look at interim improvements and uh, implementing that. So I think that's all I have. If there's any questions, I'm happy to answer. Any questions? Thank you for coming. Thank you. So the, the next item on the agenda was item three, which is discussion of high density ballot issue. I believe that was added by Ms. J. Make sure you turn on your mic, please. And um, um, Actually, myself and uh, Mr. Starker put it on. And the reason we put it on is we felt as though the discussion at our, at our strategic planning session was um, very limited, very brief, and we did not have uh, an much, much discussion of it at all, as well as there is a, um, a rather extensive report that we're missing, which is um, being prepared by citizens uh, with the help of 2020, uh, giving kind of an update as to what's going on in the community in regard to that. And we felt as though that, that study would be um, a good part of this discussion. Um, they would not be ready for that until they're, when they were scheduled for it originally was toward the end of, of uh, June, uh, starting into July. So what, what um, I talked to Britta today, and she said that any furthering, any addition, study session a little bit later would, would give them the time to do that, to finish that so we can look at what all's available as far as information. Uh, if council doesn't mind, I wanted to see if Mr. Dahl could come up and uh, address a, a few things. The, the high density was discussed in reference to a few properties in the city of Wheat Ridge that had some issues about developing. And Mr. Dahl has been researching some of the charter plus what our current code says and he has uh, I think he has some solutions here but Mr. Dahl you want to go ahead and uh, just uh, give everybody an update well I will say I don't uh, I don't have a solution to those individual parcels as of yet they're each kind of fact pardon me fact specific what I have been doing is is looking into a couple of them to see what uh, the building permit history for those properties were because as you know the charter restricts sorry am I not being heard it's usually not my problem okay great that's that's nice it's a change for me um, as you know the charter uh, provides that that if if uh, a parcel has been used or the a total the total parcel that was used to support a building permit at one point in time if you don't build you know complete you know, cover the whole parcel, then it, it basically says whatever land was used in support of that building permit can't then be, you know, sort of chopped off if it's unbuilt and used to support a second building permit if the net, of course, would be to violate the 21 unit per acre uh, restriction in the, in the charter. And of course, we do have s a, a few, they are, they are not a lot, a lot of circumstances, but we do have a, and I get that for you know, development that's in the city and is sort of current. Um, we do have a few circumstances where um, th there were uh, properties built, and the 33rd Names is a good example. Um, in that particular case, that structure was built in 1958. So, uh, you know, considerably before the city was incorporated. And my inquiry has been to, to look and see what, if anything, the building permit records in Jefferson County show about, okay, well, what property was used to support that building permit. You know, it's, it's a legitimate inquiry because that's exactly the language of the charter. And of course, it's important to follow the language of the charter unless until it's changed. But, but uh, uh, if, unless until it, it is, that language controls. So you need to look at, at what, what those building permits said was the land that was permitted to be built on. And uh, understandably, uh, the records in Jefferson County from the 50s aren't, aren't really great. And so I'm, uh, as much as I, I guess I'd like to report tonight is that I'm looking into that issue. And I will tell you, this is not a sort of a, a, a grand kind of loophole 
and I don't intend it to be. You know, that's not where I'm headed uh, to the Charter 21 Dwelling Units per Acre limitation. Uh, I think if that's to be changed as a policy matter, that really is an election matter for, for the council. And there have been charter amendments in the 18 years I've been city attorney, and I'm sure there will be more in the future. But the research I'm doing is not sort of a broad-based, gee, this is a new way of looking at it, all of a sudden it's a lot narrower in its application. Instead, it's focused on sort of historic building permits that are really quite old in a few circumstances with uh, an approach that says, does this satisfy the charter? Not trying to avoid it or create an exception to it, but, but what exactly did the charter, you know, how exactly does the charter apply to these, these developments that have been there for quite a long time? And so, uh, as you can imagine, the research is not all online. In fact, you, you know, it's none of it's online. And, and so I'm, I'm looking into that, and once I've kind of assembled uh, more of those facts, I, I'm intending to sit down with Ken Johnstone and, and get his view on it. Um, more than that, I, I simply don't have to tell you. I haven't gotten any further than that. But I, the main line I guess I'd like to draw is that that these kind of old researches don't lead to some uh, one-size-fits-all exemption to that provision. That provision exists in the charter. And if anything, there, what I'm looking at is a couple circumstances where to apply the charter fairly and properly as it is intended and as it is written, what are the facts around that? And that's what I'm working on. So uh, as I learn more, I'll give you a further report, but I, that's as, as much as I can report now. So knowing that, do you, what um, what else did you want to discuss tonight, Ms. J? Uh, to a, a later date until we resolve this question as well as have the information uh, as to what the public reaction is going on at this time, what has been ascertained information-wise. I think it's just, we came to this conclusion very hurriedly at the end of the meeting, and um, I think we haven't thought it out as is our job to do. Comments, questions? I guess Ms. J is basically asking to move another discussion forward once the data is in from 2020? Right. And Mr. Dahl will have some more information later. Exactly. So, so comments on that uh, proposal? Mr. Stipes? Oh, I'll have that you raise your hand. I mean, I, th I think the one thing we need to be careful of, and, and I think this was part of our discussion at our, our retreat, was that we don't, you know, we do have a very important ballot question that we want to put on there that we want to make sure passes um, and and so we I think that's um, one of the things we need to focus on to make sure that you know one doesn't shadow the other and you know creates a no no vote type of situation mm -hmm. and, and I think you know I think also if 2020 was um, you know for the 2020 or citizens that are involved in it whoever I mean I think we also need to let them know that that's our, you know, that was kind of our mindset as well. But I'm fine with, you know, if they want to present what they're collecting. There's also been discussions as to whether we should do a partial change to the height and density or a full city change, and we really didn't iron that out. Um, and there's also the question, if we don't do it this year, do we do it next year? So that we have some direction that, that feels a little more solid presenting that to our citizens. Ms. G, I have one question. Sure. Um, the first time they went to the ballot for the height and density, it failed. Then the compromise that we kind of proposed to the citizens was we would eliminate the height and density in the urban renewal areas, which passed, and 44th and Upham is our first success story of that. So why do we think that we need to go for a third time citywide? What's the thought process behind that? I'm bringing it up as, as only as an option that we have discussed. I have no agenda, any direction on that. It's just purely, um, it didn't feel like we really discussed it that much or really handled it. 
So I guess, Mr. Mr. DeMont. Um, I, I agree with uh, Ms. Davis too, is, <clears throat> you know, my, my feeling at the retreat was, <clears throat> I have a cold in the middle of summer. Um, I know. Uh, was not that we cut, you know, and obviously you felt differently and I didn't, you know, I'm sorry if you felt cut off, but at the retreat, but yeah, that sort of, we had decided not to discuss it, sort of not put our dog in that fight this year was more of what we had, we had, or what I felt was the agreement was not that we had limited discussion, it's just that we sort of decided that we just didn't have time to put that, put that kind of effort in this year. Um, with light to what Mr. Slattery said tonight too, that it does bring up a good point that if 2020 is, you know, going to push this and, and run this campaign, the fact that, uh, there is city money going to their organization and they're going to use that. That does sort of raise a flag to me too. Um, that's something that I actually hadn't thought about before, but, huh? Why? seems to me that when the first time the campaign was done, the city money was used for it because I remember advertising literature with council members um, supporting it. So I, I'm pretty sure that I city money has been that. used before. Well, city money can't be used for something like that. Absolutely not. No. No way. It was just person, city council members individually can support it, but yeah, individually, city sure, money, we can. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, as a citizen, but no, you can't put city money to an election. No, and directly or indirectly, and I see, you know, and that's what I'm saying, I see Mr. Slattery's point too, but, uh, um, you know, I d did you feel like we didn't have enough? Or we were maybe we cut it short, I don't know, because we did cut right at the end there. You know, it was, it was my feeling that um, when we when we had the last study session and we went to consensus that we would go to the voters for a tax increase and we and we spent a, a few minutes talking about that and then sort of as sort of an aside we said and then we won't do the height and density question um, I don't know that we've really had a, a reasoned consideration of the question whether to move forward with it or not I guess it's uh, it, it was certainly not discussed at length at our at our retreat, and we had several of our counselors that couldn't weren't able to attend that meeting. So uh, that was my my reason to support Miss J and the request that we bring this back and have and have some sort of a discussion about it again. Yeah. Well, I think yeah. If anybody feels like we didn't have enough, I'd I'd support bringing it again. We might as well talk about it. Yeah, I, I don't have any any problem talking about it again. I'm but I did, was interested in the timeline questions uh, from Mr. Dahl. Would you walk us through when this council would have to take some kind of action on this or any, and what our options were? And then there's always the petition process if someone outside the council chooses to. Would you just walk us through our choices there, when we would have a real last real opportunity to discuss this? Sure. Um, and this is pretty s sort of calendar specific, and I wasn't quite ready with the details, but I can give you what I, what I know about that. It would be a November election, and the backup dates, meaning when you've got to certify the, your ballot question to the county clerk, that's, a, that's the most important date, and that is usually toward the end of August, beginning of September, and the county clerk can record each year, because the calendar varies a little each year, but there's a, there's a time frame uh, that is kind of the latest you can submit that uh, ballot question so that it gets on the on the ballot. Uh, for that, you've got to, uh, obviously, for a charter amendments, you must pass an ordinance that, that initiates the charter amendment process. Uh, so you'd need to go through two readings of that to have that complete by, and again, I'm guessing, I think the last election calendar I saw for this year was September the 6th, but that was in Clear Creek County. And it shouldn't vary, but oddly enough it does. Sometimes as much as a week between counties, who knows, county clerks, you know, calculate differently. So I always think about September 1st as more or less the goal for getting the ballot 
question to the um, county clerk and recorder. That interestingly is also the, the date when you've set the election question that the curtain rings down on uh, uh, city funds on, on the matter uh, under the uh, on the Fair Campaign Practices Act. So you, you need to back up from roughly September the 1st a couple of meetings to be able to do an ordinance, first reading, second reading. So you're probably looking at no later than the 1st of August to introduce that ordinance and depending upon how the calendar fell, you know, a week or two off from that. Your Honor, we have to be doing something around the 1st of July, do we not, to really run that? You'd have to have the discussion so that you gave good direction to staff, we can write it up, uh, wordsmith that so that you're comfortable with it before it's introduced. Yeah, that's right. Thank you. And by that time, you should have some kind of a, a response back on some of the selected properties in the city from Mr. Dahl and the current charter restrictions. And Mr. Dahl, would you give a brief uh, overview of Mr. Slattery's um, objections or, or the question relative to Wheat Ridge 2020 about um, their ability or the legality with which they involve themselves in this question? Well, I'm uh, sure Mr. Slattery probably won't what, is this better, Tom? Is that better? Okay, all right, fine. I always, you know, you sit in meetings and people talk too loud and it hurts my ears and so I, I've, I've always been sensitive to that, but okay, not tonight. Uh, well, the Fair Campaign Practices Act, which is what governs the city, doesn't govern others, doesn't govern Wheat Ridge 2020 or any other organizations. It says that the state, or in this case, city funds may not be used to urge the electors to vote in favor of or against any question uh, on the ballot. There are a couple of exceptions. One, which is a completely worthless exception, in my opinion, is where it says, but you can create a fair and balanced discussion that, do, or, you know, memo that describes the, pr the item that has arguments for or against but does not reach a conclusion. That's a complete waste of time, and the reason, of course, is that no one on either side of the question ever thinks that the discussion on the other side was fair and balanced. They always think it was, so I uniformly tell my clients, don't bother to spend money after the election question has been certified on a fair and balanced summary, because you, you, no good deed goes unpunished, you will never get that right. So the operative date would be the date that the ballot question is finalized. And there's sort of two dates for that. One would be, gee, the effective date of your ordinance on second reading setting the ballot question. That, in my opinion, is the safer, more conservative date rather than the date that piece of paper then gets mailed to the county clerk and recorder a couple days later. And I uniformly advise my clients, until you've passed it on second reading, you have not decided what the ballot question is. And you pass it on first reading, but we all know that is not that's not the end of the, the story. It has to have been passed on second reading, but when it's passed on second reading, then city funds may not be used to urge electors to vote for or against the measure. Before and after that date, any other group that is not using city funds can spend any money they like. Uh, they obviously have to comply with the, with the reporting requirements of the Fair Campaign Practices Act, you know, filing their necessary reports, saying who you get your your contributions from, what you're spending them on as you approach the election and there's a report after, I think 30 days after the, the election. But um, the restriction on expenditure of city funds starts with the certification of the ballot or the, the finalization of the ballot question and runs all the way through election day, but does not apply to organizations that aren't spending city money. And I usually will uh, and another exception, however, that you always see is you get questions. And in fact, it came up, uh, um, uh, the Fair Campaign Practices Act specifically lets you respond to questions from the electorate. Uh, be, because I think the social policy going on here is just because it's a, it's a ballot question, your constituents legitimately think they ought to be as asking you and what do you think about this? And the, the law is really clear that you're allowed to respond to those questions be, because it just would not make sense to an elector. They can talk to you about the leash law, but they can't talk to you about this. But that's an individual 
kind of contact. City councils under the law may pass a resolution supporting or opposing, and you can do that after the ballot question has been certified. As, as I say, it's a little Swiss cheese, so there are some little holes, tiny Swiss cheese, I forget what the name for that is, but the holes are pretty small. You can pass a resolution, you can respond to individual questions uh, on, on, on letterhead, and there's an expense there. There's a $50 limitation. I was in the Senate committee when they put that on the, uh, on the law. It's not uncommon, I think, in the one case that I believe Councilmember Jay, you mentioned, uh, I think, or no, it was um, Tracy, the, um, I think all the council members des de decided they would you know, sign off on a letter, that's fine, uh, because that's, uh, that's within one of these holes in the Swiss cheese exception. But where you stop is, okay, council says, let's direct staff to put together a, uh, uh, y you know, a, um, uh, advantages of this proposal uh, sheet that gets handed out, no. Staff will get questions too, uh, and again, those are, you know, you, you can't stop doing your job as a staff member when someone calls up and says, where's this ballot question, what does it say? But I usually caution staff to, you know, stop pretty much there. These are the facts. This is the ballot question that's set for election, November, whatever. Um, it amends this XYZ section of the charter. Uh, and, and in my experience, there are plenty of other people describing what it means and why it's good or why it's bad that, that even if you wanted to and felt you had to, it, it's not a role, especially for staff, that you need to engage in. But the role for elected officials is well recognized in the law. You can go out and spend you know, half of your day every day on the stump after the question's out, saying why it ought to be defeated or why it ought to be passed. And, and because your, your role as elected officials is not diminished by the fact that there's a ballot question. You, that's a social policy question, just like a lot of others, that you're expected to still be a player on. What the city can't do is spend funds. And there have been many cases saying, well, gee, when a council member goes out and does stuff and maybe you have a, a, the, the lights are on or and, and the, the cases are uniformly saying, no, that's not a violation of the, of the Fair Campaign Practices Act that by virtue of the fact that you're, you're, you're out there using the city, you know, your city uh, office. You're expected to, frankly, and, and that's understood. What I was really getting after is oh. that the, <laughs> the, the, city, the city supports financially Wheat Ridge 2020, so they provide funding for that agency. Mm -hmm. Is it, is it um, appropriate or legal for that agency then to be an advocate using either that money or commingling it with other money that they may have or segregating other money that they may have to be an advocate for that issue? I apologize. I yeah, yeah. In fact, Mr. Slattery probably would have uh, refined that. Well, I think the conservative advice would be whatever money the city gives to Weaver 2020 for other purposes is earmarked for those purposes. Uh, and, and then you don't have the argument. Uh, there's probably an argument to be made that, you know, once you've dispersed money to Boys and Girls Clubs of Denver, you know, they can use it for their purposes. But when you're dispersing money, you get to, you have the power of the purse and the power to earmark, and you don't have, I think, what could be a legitimate argument. I, uh, that's one that I'd, I'd defend if I had to, but I'd rather not. Uh, and it would be a matter of, of making certain that it's segregated. Having said that, the fact that Wheat Ridge 2020 receives money from the city for, for purposes one, two, and three does not at all prevent Wheat Ridge 2020 from spending other money on the campaign if they wish. In other words, the fact that they've received city money, which they're not going to use to do campaign work, but they've received it for other stuff, does not all of a sudden take that organization and make them all of a sudden just like the city and they can't spend any money on the campaign. No, that, th that's absolutely uh, not true. So the, um, the safe and I haven't spoken with them, I have no idea what their, uh, their intentions would be, but to the extent the city money were segregated and, and not used, 
then you've completely taken that issue off the table. And yeah. 2020 can we fundraise with private money? Sure. Yeah, they fundraise all. They basically they they, they remain an organization that's not the government in any way. They if they receive some funds from the city, while I could argue that once received we have no further control. I think it's a better thing to do to say, okay, the funds from the city are for the particular projects the city chose to help you fund, whatever whatever those were. Uh, and if that's segregated, all the rest of their lives and their activities are as if they had no city money at all. Be because, again, uh, if uh, any other result would mean that any time you give somebody a grant, they become a city agency, and it simply isn't, isn't the case. Mr. DeMott had another question. Oh, sorry about that. Um, <coughs> I forgot what it was. Oh, um, I just wanted to make sure if we do do this, I'd like to make sure we get it finalized before our town hall meeting, which we would anyway would have to. That's July 29th, so our district three town meeting. Any other questions or comments? I guess so, oh, Mr. Stites. Yeah. <coughs> In thinking about this, and, and then I would have said it that day, but when we did do the ballot issues two years ago, three years ago, whenever that was, it was somewhat, and I realize, and I'm not so naive that I know things don't change or whatever, but it was with the understanding that we were going to stay in the urban renewal areas and the outside areas of the city on the boundaries because it wouldn't affect anybody's uh, view or you know particular things like that and then uh, we were setting it up for the uh, fast tracks system coming through if we needed that and you know Cabela's the Cab or the uh, Clear Creek Crossing site and particular things like that that really wouldn't affect anybody in the city and it was somewhat with the understanding at the time they talked about doing it for 38th and we said no uh, we needed to protect the neighborhoods and, and particular things like that that being said uh, anytime you put something on a ballot you want it to win so you want to put your best foot forward and I think it's getting a little late in the game to put anything about heightened density on this year's ballot now if you want the sales tax or whatever uh, to pass or, uh, then you don't want to convolute the election um, at all so I would be inclined just drop it just drop it, uh, the heightened density for this time, because you don't have enough time to educate the people or try to educate the people on the issues or whatever between now and the election. So my advice would be strictly do not do nothing with heightened density at this time. Uh, it's 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 not worth it. It'll convolute what you're trying to uh, pass, and then also. Uh, my concern with 2020 is when we set that up, it was always supposed to be a non-political organization, very non-political, and it should be non-political. Um, so that being said, that's my my deal. I don't. I think end it tonight. Uh, should be no more discussion on it, and we'll let it go. So we need some kind of direction or consensus to move it forward for another meeting. So you're, so Davis will have some type of direction. Because it's not unanimous, obviously. So. Yeah, I mean, we could do that. I mean, I'll take a run. I, I I agree. The dialogue was short, but I don't disagree with at the retreat. But I think it was a, the answer was correct. So I'm going to make a consensus to support Mr. Stites and and uh, drop it for this year. See how many if there's a consensus to that effect. So the consensus is to drop the height and density ballot question for this year. Uh, all in favor? One, two, three, four, let's see. One, two, three, four, five, six. I have a question though. Yes. In the event that, I mean, in the event that a citizen group did get the, the oh, yeah. then we would, we would have to have that discussion revisited, but currently we're not choosing. In the petitions, there's a separate process. And yeah. we can we wouldn't have to revisit it unless it would just come forward as a ballot question. Want to put some sort of resolution for approval. We'd have to if if, a, if they got enough Which votes, it would right. come to us, mm -hmm. correct? If right. They, at first and second reading is a charge. First and second reading. Okay. Mr. Pond. Yeah, I just just to clarify, I don't think I think there's two separate issues. So, you know, the consensus vote, not 
you know, not to try to, to, to press forward and put it on, on the ballot and make that decision. Obviously, I voted for um, that does not mean that if information comes up that we have time to to look at over the course of, of doing business, I think we should look at it and I think we should continue obviously to stay informed on on the issue. So it, it's not I think those two are, are separate things. And so, you know, just you, w w if there's reports pending and stuff like that at some w at some point, obviously, in the course of us doing business, we should take the time to to be to, to become in, in educated about those issues. Right, the consensus was not to put it on the ballot this year. We're let you, you can you can have other information about the study. What is the study you're talking about? 2020 is doing the study and they're supposed to have that done in yeah, June, right? 20, the, the, the reason I brought this up is because I mean, um, I mean, right? 2020 is um, has been working on this for a year. When I mentioned citizens groups, meaning that they're um, using their committees, there's, committees of citizens to go to go out and and take polls or get information and uh, I'm thinking to myself to just sort of say oh we've changed our we haven't you know we didn't give it a lot of a lot of time uh, we have decided not to do it and here they've been all around sputtering around trying to get all this information together uh, I agree that they should at least present the information and then they're gonna want to know okay if it's not this year will it be next year and I, th I think that we can at least um, do our jobs and, and look at what's available and then make a decision that we're really um, where well, we're at with it this year, next year. tonight that just passed said we're not going to, you guys I are going to put on the ballot I got that. this year. Right, correct. But if 2020 is doing a study and wait, some of them, I didn't know they were doing anything, so. Um. That was Tom Hart. You talked to him. That's 2020. Oh, was that what that was? Oh, that was like four months right. ago. Right, right, right. That was. In January, wasn't it? There's it came down. Two There's okay. two. So anyway, yeah. right. But if right. you, if Mr. Starker and Miss J would like to put it on the ballot, uh, not on the ballot, on a study or session or discussion to hear, yeah, that would exactly. be good. Okay, exactly. so it's two different things. So would you mind letting those folks know that the consensus was not to put it on the ballot, but council will discuss some other options right. and I think that option. They would feel as though that they weren't just okay. cut off the door. Any other questions or comments on that? And then like Ms. Langworthy mentioned, if they do a petition, that petition's a whole other process and council has to put it on by first and second reading. Okay, uh, family tree, uh, table ship, sponsorship? That's me. Oh. So I think we all got our little green card from family tree. Family tree is one of the three nonprofits in Reed Ridge that took a substantial financial cut. And we, we supported the Jefferson Center for Mental Health with the table sponsorship and Family Tree is asking for one from us too. It's um, $600 for a table of 10. I would, I'd even be okay even like making a $500 donation, just, a, you know, not necessarily straight for the table because I'm not sure if 10 of us want to go, but a donation in their benefit because they, again, they, they've taken a financial hit as well. Yeah, they were the third. How much is it? Um, the, the ask is for 600 and it would get a table of 10. But we can, I mean, if we, we could even just make a, a, a $500 donation. Um, we have 945 left in our table budget after the Jefferson Center for Mental Health. And we still have Senior Resource Center that'll probably could be coming to us for a table sponsorship as well. So does anybody have a problem with taking 600 out of the 945? Table sponsorship? June twentieth. It's um yeah it's June twentieth. It says the PPA Event Center at twenty one oh five Decatur. Yeah. Okay, so we'll take six hundred dollars out of the nine forty five from the table. Thank you, Mr. Stites. I just was thinking this weekend, kind of a fun little deal. You know, they have their uh, the family tree has their uh, second hand store there on thirty eighth. Maybe it would be kind of neat if each one of us went in there and spent five bucks and bring it to a council meeting one night and just see what we bought for five bucks. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> That's right. <laughs> well, you can get in, you just can't get out. But no, you know, j maybe we could do that later on. Something, you know, uh, where we each go in there, maybe around Christmas time or something. Yeah. And spend five bucks and just see what we can get. Uh, because I hear there's great deals up there for 29 cents and stuff. So later on, we can do that. That's well, you know, they're, um, they're doing a, um, the family tree is doing a uh, garage sale on June the 8th. Like at nine to three or something this weekend. It's this weekend, and and half of the money is going to family treat at the yeah at their store. The other is going to the Colorado Bulldog or I don't know Colorado Bulldog Association or something. I don't know what that one is exactly, but we were at Franz this weekend after or Sunday after the race for <laughs> breakfast, and I happened to see it there. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, we'll move on to elected official reports. Any comments reports? Particularly want to announce the garden. Oh, no. <laughs> uh, oh, such a, such a gentleman and a scholar he is. <laughs> I'll help you. <laughs> Look at that. Let me see it again. Let me try it again. Um, the garden tour, third annual Wee Ridge Garden Tour is Saturday, June 15th, 9 to 1. Um, and it starts at Wheat Ridge Middle School. Um, and can tickets are $15, but what's really cool is you get lunch with it because our our fellow council member here, Joey, is Patri Pete, they're, they're donating lunch. So um, you're going to get some great lunch along with this tour of gardens. There's got nine gardens, and the, they vary between very modern, and they have vegetables, and there's a whole variety of things with koi ponds. I, I think that's a fish, isn't it? K-O-I, right? It's like a big goldfish. Right. Uh, water features, perennials, and annuals galore. So it's not this weekend, but the following um, June 15th, 9 to 3. Please come. Anything else? Mr. Starker? I would uh, like to remind all of the citizens in District 1 that we're going to have a uh, District 1 listening session at the old firehouse at um, uh, just off of 29th and or 30th and 32nd and Chase is it I think Chase Street Depew mm -hmm. so my directions could get a little hazy sometimes it's a, this this um, Friday June the 7th 2013 at 5 p.m. not at 6 p.m. it starts at 5 p.m. and it'll go about an hour so I hope everyone will come Thank you. Anything else? Good. I just want, like I said, I wanted to kind of give you the heads up tonight about Mr. Dahl's research because if everything goes the way hopefully it can go, there's some properties in the city that can actually build based on the age of the property and the, and the lots, how they were subdivided. So he'll have more information. The only thing is, is that um, council may have to amend the subdivision regulations so they reflect the new, the new ruling. Okay, thank you. We're adjourned.